was the new capital of free China, Chongqing. Here on the cliffs high above the Yangtze River, the Chinese had re-established their government. They knew, however, that the people of the city would not be safe from Jap air raids. The memories of Shanghai were fresh in their minds. And in the sandstone cliff on which the city is built, thousands of workmen rushed the construction of enormous caves as shelters for the people and for the pitifully few machines, more important than life. To the Japs, Chongqing became the heart of the Chinese nation they were determined to conquer. Destroy Chongqing, and they would break the spirit of new China. As they couldn't reach the city by land, they would send their bombers to blast it from the face of the earth. Japanese armadas, slow and obsolete Chinese planes made a suicidal attempt to defend Chongqing. Neither Japanese planes nor Japanese bombs could destroy the life of the city. For not only the people, but the factories had gone underground, where the vital machines could operate by day and by night, safe from bombs and shrapnel. This time, the Chinese had anticipated their enemy. In spite of bombs and fire and destruction, this time the Chinese stood fast. Flaming Chongqing became the symbol of their indestructible spirit. the call to arms sounded throughout New China. And from the vast interior, China's millions answered the call. They came from the south and from the north, from the east and from the 
West to form a people's army. With a new faith in their hearts, men and women left their homes and farms to fight for something bigger now than each man's home and each man's farm and each man's life. They were fighting for new China. New soldiers, awkward and unskilled, like all new soldiers. But they toughened and trained. They learned the discipline and order of drill. They knew they must strike and strike hard. They learned to kill. The youth of China also came forward, training to care for the sick and the wounded. Girls joined their husbands, brothers, and sweethearts in uniform. And to the aid of China came volunteers from other lands, men who pledged themselves to fight against tyranny and oppression no matter where. Americans like the legendary Colonel Chenault and his Flying Tigers, who with their few American planes were knocking down enemy planes at the fantastic ratio of 20 nips to one of their own. The Japs that hoped to ride to world conquest on the back of the giant Chinese workhorse. Phase two of the Tanaka plan called for breaking the horse to their will, but the great patient horse refused to be broken. The enraged Japs saw their whole plan of conquest bogging down. So they set out to drain the giant's strength by cutting the arteries through which flowed China's lifeblood of supplies. They penetrated along the rivers. Railroads destroyed by the Chinese were rebuilt with slave labor as the Japanese moved inland to secure control of key rail lines and important communications. And China's supply lines from the outside world were cut off by Jap warships blockading the coast. The Japanese strategy was the isolation of China. Port after port was occupied. This meant China was being cut off from supplies she couldn't manufacture for herself. Supplies she was getting from her Western friends. Without oil, gas, guns, and planes, China was doomed. With the whole of the Chinese coast in the hands of the Japs, there would only be two routes over which to bring the vitally necessary materials. From Indochina, a narrow gauge railway ran inland from the sea to Kunming, connecting with a truck road that went to Chongqing. But its capacity was limited. And then there was the old trail of the camel caravans from Russia across the Gobi Desert, which could bring in even less. Not only did these routes provide too little for China's needs, but they were too near Jap territory to be safe. There was only one other possibility. In Burma was a railroad that ran from the port of Rangoon to Lashio. Separating it from the truck road at Kunming were hundreds of miles of high mountains and deep river gorges. If this stretch of tortuous mountain trails could be replaced by a modern highway, where now only pack trains could pick their plodding way, China would have a practical supply route to Burma from the sea. Several internationally known firms of engineers were called in to do the job. They said the work might be completed in six or seven years if China could supply them with the most modern machinery. But China didn't have the modern machinery, nor did she have the six or seven years. So she began building the road with her bare hands.